the University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Today, it's my huge pleasure to introduce Jeanette Wing. Jeanette is an old friend of mine. Uh, we're both older than we like to admit, although I'm older than she is. Uh, she is a Corporate Vice President for Research at Microsoft, and in that capacity, directs Microsoft's research labs, uh, not just in Redmond, but around the world. Uh, from 2007 to 2010, she was the uh, Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. The Assistant Director runs the part of National Science Foundation, in that case, that oversaw probably a $700 million annual computing research budget. Uh, both before and after that, she was the head of the uh, uh, computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University, and she spent the bulk of her academic career at CMU, where she developed uh, a superb reputation in software engineering, programming languages, trustworthy computing, and also uh, coined the term and the substance behind this uh, uh, notion of computational thinking, which we all talk about all the time now, the reason that every uh, every kid and every person in the 21st century needs to understand some computer science. Uh, Jeanette got all three of her degrees from MIT, her PhD with my best friend John Guttag, which is how I first met her back in the 1980s, I guess, long ago. Anyway, Jeanette, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I always like coming to UW and giving talks uh, to the, the faculty and the students here. Today, I'm going to talk about Microsoft Research and some of the research that we're doing at Microsoft Research that's beyond the horizon. Before I start telling you about some of the research, I wanted to actually cast it in the context of what Microsoft Research stands for, what we do, what our value system is, and who we are. And so let me start, first of all, with the mission statement of Microsoft Research, which was founded in almost 25 years ago. And this mission statement has stayed tried and true from the very beginning. And it was created by Rick Rashid, the one who started Microsoft Research. The first statement in the mission statement is advanced state of the art. And this is really about pushing the frontiers of research, much like we do in academia, pushing the frontiers of science, advanced state of the art. The second is, of course, expedite tech transfer to the company. And this is what distinguishes academic research from industrial research. We have opportunities in a large corporation like Microsoft to actually choose problems of scale that matter to a, a large corporation like Microsoft in, to inspire and inform the kinds of research problems we work on. And, so, and, and the flip of that is, of course, then we have the potential to impact hundreds of millions of people through our research. And the last mission statement, part of the mission statement, is about ensuring the future of the company. And it's like any research organization. It is about the insurance policy that one has in the back pocket for that organization to ensure that there's a future for the company. You always want to go to that research arm of your organization. It's much like, in some sense, if I may draw the analogy, that the National Science Foundation is to the country. Um, that's why we do basic research at NSF, so that we can ensure the, the success and future of the United States. So um, Microsoft is committed to, to basic research. And there are three aspects of the kind of research that we do in Microsoft Research that I wanted to really hammer home with you. One is we are committed to basic research. And by that I mean it's simply, as you probably think of it, as curiosity-driven research. You, you uh, wonder about why something works. You wonder why or how, uh, you know, trying to understand the phenomenon that you observe. And that is really what drives the kinds of questions you ask, what kinds of problems you tackle, and the research problems you choose. The second is we're, we are an open research environment. By that, I mean we do the obvious, thing, obvious things like in academia. We publish. We go to conferences. We um, host interns and faculty. Uh, we're very open. We tell people what we do. And more concretely, we very much uh, relish and rely on our partnerships with academia. So we have a very close relationship, obviously, with UW, because you're just across 
the, the lake from us, but we partner with academics and even other industrial research um, researchers uh, in everything we do. I think a few years ago, um, we were calculating uh, that 85% of the papers that we had published in that year were co-authored with faculty and graduate students. So that's how much we are so much a partner with academia. And lastly, we really do believe in long-term research. And by that, I, I, again, this goes back to the mission statement of ensuring the success and future of the company. Um, and the best example of that is, an, is a work that, is, that you might be familiar with, which is a Skype translator. This ability to, when you're having a Skype session and talking to someone, say, abroad, that that person abroad can be speaking in a foreign language and you can be speaking, say, in English, and you can have a commu uh, conversation with that person because of real-time speech-to-speech uh, translation. And that capability, which is now in our product, of course, arose because of decades of research in speech and natural language processing, speech recognition, and so on. And, and also, especially the more um, recent advances in machine learning, in particular deep neural networks. So you if you have a core basic research lab that believes in long-term research, you can be doing this very core basic research that then, 15, 20 years later, actually might make it um, possible for you to uh, do products and services that can, again, reach hundreds of millions of people. Um, so our values are very much as in academia. Of course, excellence in who we are and what we do. Openness, I already talked about in terms of working with lots of people in lots of different kinds of organizations. And the other value that we very much cherish in Microsoft Research is trusting our people to choose what problems they want to work on and how to solve them. This is known as bottom-up research. In other words, it is very much like in academia where faculty choose what problems to work on, graduate students choose what problems to work on, and at, at least in, in Microsoft Research, and management stays out of the way. So we don't tell our researchers what to do. And I think we attract a certain kind of person to Microsoft Research because of our value system, because of our culture, and because of the kind of work that one can do in an industrial research environment. So we are worldwide. We have labs, of course, here in Redmond. We have a lab in New York. We have a lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right next to MIT. We have a lab in Cambridge, England. Um, a lab in Bangalore, India, and a lab in Beijing, China. Um, we also have a quantum effort in Santa Barbara, which we call Station Q. Um, and then we have a other small lab in the Redmond lab called Fuse Labs. So we are over 1,000 uh, PhDs and scientists and engineers in Microsoft Research. We're quite a large organization. One can say we're the largest computer science department in the universe. Um, and, and I already mentioned that we reach hundreds of uh, we, we reach hundreds of products and services and, and millions of users. So how do we measure our success, or how do we measure um, how we do, and how do we measure our impact? I like to think about it in terms of our scientific impact, our impact on technology, and our impact on society. And all of our, if you look at our research portfolio, we have impact on all three of these uh, dimensions. Certainly in terms of science, in, in advancing the state of the art, in all the publications and honors and awards that our people receive, it is about um, measurable impact in that way. In terms of technology, uh, certainly the kinds of tech transfers that we do in the company are a measurable ways of how we have impact on the on uh, the IT industry more generally. And then we actually have researchers whose primary focus is actually to help, for instance, emerging markets or education uh, or um, other societal grand challenges like environment and so on. So we have people who directly look at societal impact as their mission in their research. 
So one thing that I wanted to say is Microsoft Research will be 25 years old next year. And one can ask, in the, in, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know that Microsoft, the company, has changed in the past two and a half years. A new CEO, reorganizations. Um, I have a new boss. It was like the third boss I've had in a year or two or something. So what, you can ask what's different. I, I talked about how Microsoft Research has stuck tried and true to its mission, its values, its culture. Um, one of the things I'm trying to encourage the Microsoft researchers is what I call think bolder, aim higher. And for those of you who knew me uh, from my NSF days, it was very similar to what I was trying to encourage the community when I put out the expeditions program. Um, which is really to galvanize the community to think bolder and aim higher. And so I'm doing the same thing with the Microsoft researchers internally. Uh, and, in, and in fact, I'm running an expeditions program internal to Microsoft Research. By think bolder and aim higher, it, it is also, it's for both scientific impact and company impact. Scientific impact is really think, OK, I'm going to work on a research agenda that actually might take me five years out before I can really um, make, uh, you know, nail it. And I will make progress along the way, but I will actually put a stake in the ground that far out. And, uh, and similarly with the kind of tech transfer that we do, we do a lot of tech transfer, but the, it's more impactful tech transfer that I'm encouraging the researchers to look for. And the other thing that's quite different, given the new um, management and leadership that we have at Microsoft and Microsoft Research, is company impact. We have, over the past 25-year history of Microsoft Research, had, have really enjoyed a stellar reputation in academia because of our scientific impact. We're able to draw um, top-notch people to Microsoft Research because of the academic culture we have because we do encourage publication and so on. And now there's an emphasis to have as, as much company impact as we've had scientific impact. Um, so I just wanted to say that things are a little different in those respects. So I like to think about Microsoft, so Microsoft research of 1,000 people. Imagine if you had a computer science department here at UW with 1,000 people. How are you even going to think about categorizing what it is a 1,000 people do. So I roughly categorize um, what we do in terms of, obviously, the research areas. Bucketing, uh, anything and everything having to do with human and artificial, uh, human and machine intelligence, um, theory, um, systems, very broadly speaking, and then we, and the sciences. And we actually have a, a robust research activities in all four groupings. And you can see some of the specific areas that many of you are just familiar with, because it's your own area, um, that we do research in. So I wanted to, you know, uh, for the purposes of this talk, just showcase three research projects that are going on to give you a sampling of the kind of research we do and some of the hot areas and hot projects that we're working on. So I, I will start with the integrative intelligence, the combination of vision and language. And uh, then I'm going to talk about safe cyber physical systems, and finally talk a little bit about our work in biological computation. So when I start on talking about uh, this, this vision, this integrative intelligence, vision and language, the work I'm going to talk about is image captioning. But let me take a few uh, steps back from that and give you the bigger picture of how I see the world. So, and, and I guess I'm old enough to see the world in some respect. Um, before my time, <laughs> in the 60s, <laughs> um, that really artificial intelligence was born, if you will, out of a Dartmouth conference in 1965, when the grandfathers of AI had ha happened to get together, and the, the term AI came, came out of that conference. And they wanted, they, they put a grand AI grand challenge in front of them, which was to essentially build a machine that would mimic the intelligence of humans. And immediately from that 
full vision, the grandfathers realized that that was far too ambitious a vision to just solve like that, stated like that. So immediately, not immediately, but very soon after, that broke down into let's solve the subtasks that humans are good at. For instance, vision and speech and language and manipulation and so on. And those, each of those subtasks in trying to solve them, each led to a whole sub-area of computer science. So you have computer vision, and you have speech and natural language processing, and you have robotics, um, and so on and so forth. And so this, the, over the decades, we've seen these sub-areas grow to be their own humongous communities. What's happened recently is that techniques like machine learning, uh, specifically deep neural networks and so on, have started to bring these subfields together. And now there's this hope, this taste in the air that maybe we can bring these intelligences together and tackle the grand AI challenge again. So this is probably what John Markoff is going to talk about next week. Um, so this work on image captioning is an example of bringing vision and text together. So let me start with, now I'm going to go into the, inter, in the active learning phase of my talk <laughs> and, and ask the audience a question. So there's an image here, and there are two captions. So one caption is, a man standing on a tennis court holding a racket. And the other caption is, the man is on the tennis court playing a game. So the question I'm going to ask is, which one of these captions was generated by a machine? So how many people think the first, the top caption was generated by a machine? And how many think the second one was? Wow, this is like 50-50. Well, the, the first one was. So now let's try, try one more example. Same game. Here's an image. Two captions. A woman is standing near the road with a dog on a leash. A blurry photo of a woman walking down the street. So how many people think the top caption was generated by a machine? And how many people think the bottom one was? The bottom one. Wow. So are you stunned? Are you impressed? <laughs> so how does this work? How, and this is work uh, done by various researchers uh, at Microsoft. So we, you take an image, you do some in image processing on it, generating some words that make sense with respect to that image. And then once you have a bag of words, then you just generate all possible captions or reasonable possible captions. And then you rank them, and then you spit out the top one. So that's the general pipeline of how this works. Now, how many, like, out of my, for my information, how many of you in the audience are machine learning experts? OK, that's Noah there. OK, so Noah, close, close your ears. No, actually. So just for Noah's sake, this is how it really works. Um, so we use the output of a convolutional neural network, which is state of the art in image processing, uh, to predict the, these visual concepts in the image, like the baseball and the throwing. And then we use what's called the maximum entropy language model to generate every word in sequence. And because there's not a lot of you in machine learning, I just won't belabor that, but Noah understands. And finally, we actually use two, uh, we learn two deep neural networks that uh, for the last stage that map into the same vector representation so that we can do similarity on, uh, between image uh, concepts and text. Uh, in a measurable way. So those are the details of how that works. Now, the other thing that came out of this project um, is actually what's known as the Microsoft Cocoa uh, database. 
And this is a huge data set that we worked with the academic community of images that are segmented and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And there's a huge community that worked on this. And now, actually, the academic community um, owns and runs this. So there are over 300,000 images, 2 million segmentations that took 700, uh, and, and some of them are people. And there, we had uh, workers, crowd workers, uh, label these images with captions. And over 100,000 worker hours were uh, needed to produce this labeled image set. And this is really one of the ways in which Microsoft Research likes to work with the academic community, that we provide these, the, the resources to uh, enable these kinds of data sets and then make sure that the data sets are open and pub for public use. So there are other kinds of examples of, of captions that our image captioning system um, produced for these, these pictures. I'll just let you read them. But what's interesting is where we want to go next with this. So you see an image here, and you see a caption. But the hardest part of this work was actually determining whether the caption was good or not. Um, how do you measure whether it's a human would say that's a good caption? So the work that we are looking at next is different in two ways. One is that we want to do what's called visual question and answering. We want to actually understand the semantics of the image. So here's a, an image, and we want to be able to answer the question, does this person have 20-20 vision? There's nothing in that image that says anything about 20-20 vision. But when you and I look at that, we see the person has glasses, and so we infer that he probably doesn't have 20-20 vision. That takes a lot of human reasoning that to us is, well, we learned some of that. Some of it is common sense. And similarly here, there's a, a pizza with, I think, what's sausage on it. And we ask the question, is this vegetarian? And you and I know immediately, no, uh, it's got sausage on it. So there's some reasoning that we'd like to be able to do about these images that goes beyond object segmentation and classification. And this is a hard problem. Now, the other thing that we did was to make sure we set up this system so that there are yes, no answers to the question. So there's a good metric of uh, whether you got it right or wrong, as opposed to would a human uh, choose this particular caption for, for an image. These are all very interesting research questions in terms of how do you run experiments um, when you're trying to measure against human ability. So before I go on to my next story, I just have to share with you some really uh, uh, great, interesting, breaking news from NIPS. NIPS is happening as I speak in Montreal. This is one of the top uh, machine learning conferences. Uh, the breaking news is that a group of MSR researchers w uh, won the ImageNet challenge by a large margin. And the ImageNet challenge task is to do a, a classification of, of objects in an image. So is it a cat? Is it a dog? That sort of task. Interestingly, the system they, that used, they used to win this competition won it with a deep neural network of 152 layers. So for those of you who are in the machine learning community, this is astounding because just three years ago, Eight was a large number of layers. Just last year, 20 or 30 was a large number of layers. And so who knows next year if they're going to go to yet another order of magnitude. But the real astounding or mysterious thing is, why should 152 even work? And this, there's an interesting science question here, because we don't know why. Um, moreover, the researchers decided to use the same system and on the Microsoft uh, Coco challenge, and the tasks there are detecting uh, objects, uh, localization, and segmentation. 
very different image processing tasks from classification. And it turns out that with this same system, they also won the Microsoft uh, Cocoa Challenge. So this is another astounding phenomenon. Not only is, is 100, 152 a mystery, but this shows that there's something going on in these DNNs called transfer learning, that a model trained on a particular task is actually also good for other tasks. This is amazing. And in fact, we also found this in the Skype translator, where we found a model trained to translate between English and German also improved the translation for Chinese. And you know what? We don't know why any of this works. We don't know why 152. We don't know how this transfer learning happens. This is for the graduate students and undergraduates in the audience to figure out. This is the science that's left to be done. So please <laughs> help us figure it out. Otherwise, it's going to just be lots of experiments on lots of compute power with lots of data and parameter tweaking. And that is part of science, of course. But it would be nice to understand why this all works. And that is what I mean by advancing state of the art. OK, so was that, was that a good challenge for you? Good. So, oh, by the way, just to brag a little more, we also won the Outstanding Best Paper Award. So, uh, good. OK, so now let me turn to my second story, something completely different. And that is a project, the expedition, in fact, that we're funding at Microsoft on uh, safe cyber physical systems. And Again, it's a multitude of researchers within MSR, but also many academic partners and even governor, government partners um, involved in this particular uh, project. So let me motivate this safe CPS project with this little video. That's my favorite. So right now, drones are kind of a hobbyist uh, cyber physical system platform. But of course, you, you know that companies are looking into it for package delivery. And there are already real estate agencies that are using drones to go to places that humans can't go to very easily. So the, we in the, the Safe CPS project are actually using drones as our cyber physical system platform. And obviously, from this kind of, these kinds of scenarios, we want to avoid them. So the approach that we're taking is to look at layers of this safe CPS platform and the application in terms of verifying each of the layers 
as we go up the stack. So we start with, on the bottom, a real-time operating system called Verve that we've also built at Microsoft Research that is provably safe with respect to type safety and memory safety. And so we start with a secure OS, and then we go up the stack. We want robust sensing because the cameras on the drones could, could be faulty, but they could also get faulty input or incomplete input. And we also need cor con correct control. Obviously, you've got a drone flying around. You actually need to control it in some correct manner. And finally, at the highest level, there's a mission that this drone is supposed to uh, uh, execute, for instance, go from A to B, and you need to plan that route. So again, all in the presence of uncertainty in the environment, failures that can happen due to the equipment itself, um, and then, of course, failures of the software. So this is a hard problem, is what I'm trying to say. And fortunately, we have at Microsoft Research tremendous expertise in each of these layers in terms of the verification um, and validation that we uh, can do. What I wanted to do is just talk about one of the layers and some new work that came out just this summer on cor correct control. And we use all the tools of, of, of formal methods and verification that we have at our fingertips. Uh, many of you are familiar, for instance, with Z3 as a constraint solver. We certainly use that. Um, and let me start just basically setting up the problem and how we're approaching it. So uh, think of this system as having a state. And of course, it has a location, x, y, z coordinates, and then the angles. Um, roll, pitch, and yaw, and then the um, first derivatives of those, so velocity and angular velocity. And then um, we can write down a state equation that says current state, next state. We want to optimize uh, control, and so we do that with respect to a cost function that has to take into consideration how far we are away or deviating from a reference point plus the cost of actually controlling ourselves to be um, within that reference point. And so there's a function that we try to um, minimize. But here's now where I bring together control theory and computer science. And that is we want to do all of this subject to a safety constraint. And so we want some behavior which is going to be state control, state control, state control. So each x and u is a pair uh, of, you can think of current state of the drone. And, and, and this is a sequence of such pairs that give us a single behavior. And for all such behaviors, we want it to be, uh, we want it to satisfy a given safety property. And so what is phi? Phi is in the new work that I'm going to very briefly touch on is a new kind of temporal logic, which we call probabilistic signal temporal logic. And the key aha, or the brilliant insight, is actually, uh, this is also for Noah's benefit, uh, to bring in machine learning into this. And we actually embed a Bayesian classifier into these formula so that we can um, argue about the probability of a particular event happening. So we use a Bayesian classifier to model the uncertainty in the environment. And so think about this um, blue line as a wall. And my property is I, wanna, I want the drone, drone to be, you know, I don't want it to go too close to the wall, like five feet away from the wall. So actually, we use training data, those are the purple dots, to tell us, well, you're near the wall, you're near the wall, you're near the wall. Um, as we, and, and we don't you know, do the whole wall, we just do some segment of it. And then we use a training set to build this classifier. And so now, and that's, just think of this W as that classifier. You're near the wall, you're not near the wall. And then this is, this is I, I, I'm, uh, the atomic predicate in the logic that shows that it really is a statement, a probabilistic statement over some random variable drawn uh, from this distribution. But this is the key part is that we identify um, uh, the 
truth of a, a, the pro uh, property with this probability. So that's the key insight that's linking not just control theory with computer science, but also the Bayesian class or machine learning um, for reasoning about uncertainty for the drone. So this is, a, this is the logic. And the beauty of this, and I'm not going to go through this, obviously, is that for any particular um, property that you might care about, like are you five feet away from the wall, that is just one W. You can imagine another classifier saying, you know, are you 10 feet from the ground? And all of this is composable. So that's, that's kind of nice. So that's a little math for those of you who are like math. Um, but let me pop up a few levels and say, the Safe CPS team is highly ambitious. Not only do they want to prove safety of the drones they fly, but they actually have some incredibly ambitious applications. And this is one that is so far reaching, um, but so delightful that I have to share it with you. So the idea is not, to, not do I not only want this drone to go from A to B, but the payload on this drone is going to be a mosquito trap. And I'm going to fly this drone into remote regions in forests that have mosquitoes. I'll put the mosquito trap down, catch the mosquitoes, fly back, pick up the mosquitoes, and bring the mosquito trap back to my lab, do DNA testing on the saliva in the mosquitoes to determine whether this is a, a malaria-carrying mosquito or not. This is the big end-to-end -end scenario. So not only are we talking about drones, but we're talking about mosquitoes. We're talking about genetic uh, you know, DNA sequencing in somewhat real time. And we're actually also talking about helping regions determine whether they have infest infestations or not. So this, this um, video is going to hint to you as the grand vision of what this team wants to do. And what they did was, in April, they brought a few drones and a very primitive mosquito trap to Granada. And they tested out whether this end-to-end -end scenario would work. Now, you're not going to see the mosquito trap that they have since built, which is the world's most sophisticated mosquito trap. Um, and I can explain that uh, offline. Um, but you get the idea of what they want to do from this video. The overall goal of this project is to monitor infectious agents as they move across the planet. So in the end game, we'd like to have a global system available that detects new infectious agents and then monitors their movement as they emerge. In this way, we can intervene before they become an epidemic or before they become an infectious problem for humans or wildlife. The mosquito is the most dangerous animal on the planet because it carries so many pathogens. What we want to do is to be able to catch that mosquito efficiently at scale and at low cost. Current uh, collection technologies are, are very limited and, and present a lot of biases. When we do this in the field now, um, it takes a, a lot of effort and money and personnel time. The big challenge is going to be creating new traps that can collect mosquitoes that's drone portable and that can be automated in a very uh, efficient way. What our team will do is take the mosquitoes and then deep sequence them. The results of that sequencing will be placed through a series of computational steps that will detect viruses and will distinguish between viruses that are known viruses and those that are novel viruses. So right now our ability to analyze these sequences depends on computer power. We're going to have to expand our computational power and we're going to have to, have to develop new algorithms that can process the data much faster. What we want to apply to achieve a goal like this are our advanced operating systems, uh, analysis tools to find bugs in software before they're in the wild, machine learning and vision to add complex autonomy into these drones so that they can make decisions, and then finally cloud computing and genomics so that we can at scale analyze the complex data we obtain. I believe in the next five years 
a system like this is attainable. I hope you think that that's pretty ambitious. <laughs> okay, so my last uh, a couple of stories will have to do with uh, biology, biological computation. And we have quite a large biological computation group in Microsoft Research. Most of them are in our Cambridge lab. And they also partner extensively with academics and companies like AstraZeneca. We group our work in biological computation into three pieces. Understanding computation in biological systems. Um, programming computation. So take a biological system like a living cell and actually program it to do what you want it to do. And then platforms, including verification and model checking like platforms that, that others can use. And I wanted to just do uh, a couple of stories, one specifically on stem cell computation, and then later, very, very quickly, something on DNA computing. So the, uh, the notion of you know, what makes a stem cell a stem cell are really two properties. One is called um, pluripotency, that a stem cell can uh, become any uh, one of many cells, it could become a liver cell, it could become a lung cell, it could become a brain cell. Um, and the other is this notion of self-renewing. It's in its naive state, it uh, divides indefinitely. And so and the, um, the importance about stem cells is that we already know from biology that we can actually take an adult stem cell, uh, 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 adult stem, stem cell, and um, reprogram it to become like a liver cell or a brain cell or a lung cell. But we don't know how to do that with kind of the embryonic stem cells. So there's still some biology that we don't understand. Of course, the hope is that once we know how to make a stem cell become a liver cell, then there's this hope of being able to actually grow organs um, for, say, transplantation. So what we do know from biology is that given a stem cell to retain its naive pluripotency state, um, there are three signals um, that's on the left here, uh, LIF, Chiron, and PD. Two out of three are needed to um, maintain this uh, stem cell in a naive pluripotency state. And so what we can do is we can measure the expression of key genes in the stem cell under different combinations of these signals, and we get a heat map. Um, and from this heat map, we can create something that computer scientists are very familiar with, which is just think of this as a, a graphical model, where the blue nodes are genes, these three black nodes are the signals, and the black lines indicate some positive interaction between the two genes based on the heat map. And the red lines uh, uh, represent some kind of inhibitory um, behavior. And then once you have this model, then you can actually imagine looking at all possible Boolean networks that this model represents. In fact, there are 10 to the 43 Boolean networks that this model possibly represents. Now, we in computer science are very comfortable with huge state spaces, especially drawing on our verification technology like model checkers and constraint solvers. And so in fact, what we did, with, uh, what the, the researchers did, was they built a special purpose tool out of Z3 to, so that they can do some reasoning on these kinds of Boolean networks. And of course, 10 to the 43 uh, there might be 10 to the 43 possible combinations just given this graph, but not all 10 to the 43 Boolean networks are physically um, observed in nature. So what we can do is use this tool to constrain the number of networks that actually are, are consistent with experimental evidence from the laboratory. 
And that's exactly what we did. And in doing so, the set of possible models was constrained by experimentally observed behaviors. And by doing that, we came up with what I like to call the kernel uh, model that, ref that is consistent with all experimental behavior that's needed for a stem cell to retain its naive state. This, this model here is the new biology that came out of applying somewhat off-the-shelf computer science tools to this problem. So this was a, a, actually a paper in science. Moreover, with that, then you can start doing, you can ask a, a, a whether this model can actually predict any new um, information. And so the researchers um, used a large number of 53 non-intuitive predictions uh, of the response of the network to genetic perturbations. And these predictions were experimentally validated with over a 70% accuracy rate, which I am told in the biology community is unheard of, that high an accuracy rate. So this was um, really computer science applied to biology discovering new biology. Pretty fundamental. Very quickly, I wanted to share with you some of the work that we're doing in DNA computing. Uh, and I know that there's some interest here at UW on that, on this. Uh, in fact, working with some of our colleagues at Microsoft Research Cambridge. There's a language that this group of colleagues worked on uh, that's been used to actually design DNA computers or devices. I'm not going to go into the language um, a lot, but I'll just say that the primitive um, notion behind this language is what's called DNA strand displacement. The idea here is you have a substrate, and if you want to, um, if you want to build an AND gate, then you can do so, and this would be the substrate that would, for instance, take two inputs, oops, take two inputs, and the, there would be a binding of this input in such a way that um, uh, that would happen, and then a binding of the other, and the output would be the and of the two inputs. So the point is, with DNA, you can actually compute functions, these Boolean functions, and then you can actually build circuits. One of the largest circuits that was built, and this is work in combination with um, some Caltech researchers was a, a circuit made out of 74 DNA molecules that computed the square root of a four-bit integer. So, well, we're getting there. It did some real computation. And oh, by the way, because there were formal methods and programming language people involved in this, they proved it correct. <laughs> OK. And Another uh, result that came out of this effort was the world's first programmable DNA computer. And here, this uh, device that they built actually did a very, very simple distributed consensus protocol where you had many agents, uh, some of which were voting yes, and some of which majority voting say yes and the minority voting no. And at the end of the computation, the consensus happened so that all the agents voted yes. So simple idea, um, but show, it shows the power, the potential power of DNA computing. So lots of papers, very proud of. This is a pretty young group. Um, but they are publishing in the top conferences, uh, journals. OK, so that I'm going to conclude here and just wrap up and say the research that we do at Microsoft is about impacting science, impacting technology, and impacting society. Thank you.
right? So inherently, driving stuff into products will require you to protect things like create new bits or implementations and whatnot, and protect the value to the company in certain products. But how do you prevent that from overtaking the openness? Well, that's partly my job. Um, it's uh, oh, the question is with a drive towards um, make. Uh, applying research to, to products and services, how do we ensure that we protect the open environment that Microsoft Research is so well known for? Um, it is so much in our culture and our DNA to be open and to, to blab about everything we do. I think it, we, we don't worry so much about that. Um, I, I think that um, we, when we work with academic partners, there are two ways in which we make this happen. First of all, if academia comes to us within our walls, then they have access to data and code and all sorts of things that they normally would, you normally would not. And within the, that framework, when you're publishing a paper based on that joint work, uh, obviously there are ways to, um, you know, uh, uh, make the work publishable. We, we will be careful about what data we actually publish, what numbers we put in, and, and so on. And, but we have a long history of, of doing that with our product teams. So that's when academia comes uh, to work with us. The other, um, the, the other thing is we also um, really work hard to try to, um, especially now with the new Microsoft, we're very much encouraged to use and be part of the open source community. So we're now putting lots of stuff out there for the whole community to use. We've always done that, but now we feel empowered that we can. So that openness is also just part of being, um, you know, interacting, being part of the ecosystem. And of course, even within Microsoft, when we're using open source, there are uh, they're the, the same kinds of concerns. So we have processes in place to make sure that that can all work. Can I make one other comment yeah. on this question? And that is, in order to transfer technology, there has to be a pitcher and there has to be a catcher, all right? It's, it's a, uh, there's sort of two sides to it. There has to be receptivity on the part of the product groups. And I think one of the important changes in the company in the past few years is far greater receptivity and a recognition, you know, when things are going 100% great, you don't need other people's ideas, right? When things are under stress, maybe you're a little more open to recognizing that uh, some new ideas might catapult things forward. So I think that, that uh, uh, in addition to perhaps a new attitude on the side of Microsoft Research, there's definitely a new attitude on the side of the product groups and the rest of the company towards incorporating ideas in uh, sort of future products. That's a great, um a uh, point, Ed, uh, it is very much different now than when I even first joined two and a half, three years ago. Um, the company is actually looking to Microsoft Research for ideas, for um, talent, uh, in a way that is never before. And this is a new Microsoft, it's a new world that where Microsoft Research is front and center in the innovation story for the company. So it's very exciting. Uh, it's a little scary, <laughs> but it's very exciting. Um, and, and I have been personally um, going around to different engineering groups because of my own research area is still in security and privacy. I have been going around to different engineering groups and saying, what are your privacy pain points? And they come up with the, you know, some of the hardest problems, like the data deletion problem in privacy, we know is a hard, I, I mentioned this because some of the early work on data deletion was done here at UW, and so those people in the audience know how hard that problem is. And now, even the notion of what data is, it's not just, you know, bits, it's also behavior and patterns. I mean, it's, it's not just data and derived data now, it's, it's something that you can't actually write down. So how do you delete that? So it's a hard problem. So anyway, more. their company is just full of really juicy research problems. Um, yes, Luis. Yeah, so um, I have a, actually a question about other corporate companies, and not about Microsoft Research. So um, why do you think the younger technology companies have had you know, similar or thought of similar you know, ways as Microsoft and not, don't seem to be developing a research collaboration? Is it, 
Uh, well, it's a good question. I would actually, uh, I would say almost say up, up until a couple years ago, Microsoft Research was unique in terms of an industrial research organization that had a basic research lab. Now, obviously, there are, are a couple of companies in the kind of the Bay Area that are starting uh, what they call basic research labs, specifically in AI. Um, and, and I think when, I, I, when they first started and they say, we, we want to be like Microsoft Research, it's really kudos to us that we recognize the importance of basic research. Now, they haven't had as much history um, as we have, so it's, it's uh, hard to tell how long they will stick to that. We are open, we, are, we do basic research. Um, I think you know, Microsoft is uh, a very special company in that it, it's the Microsoft research started with a real commitment from the very top to basic research. And not just you know, uh, Rick Rash who started, but Nathan Mirvold and Bill Gates really was committed uh, and just loved basic research. And so that is part of our culture now, part of our history. I don't know that other CEOs of younger companies, um, IT companies, recognize that, that kind of value uh, that basic research can bring to a company. So let me try a bit of this as well, just to let Jeanette a bit off the hook, and then we'll have refreshments. You know, the, my, my view of this is Microsoft's investment in Microsoft Research is approximately the same in dollars per year as Jeanette was spending in the National Science Foundation on computing research, and it's approximately the same as the DARPA investment annually. Okay, so to first approximation, they each spend half a billion dollars apiece. So, you know, and so I consider MSR as being important to the future of the field and the future of the nation. And one issue with other companies is the issue of what uh, economists call appropriability. That is, if you're going to invest, you want to believe that you and your shareholders, because that's the job of a company, stand a, a likelihood of being the principal beneficiaries. And I think a company needs to be of a particular size and a particular position in an industry before they're likely to be able to feel that they can appropriate the benefits of research, particularly if that research is, uh, is open. So it's, it's a real challenge. But if you go back, gosh help us, 30 years, 40 years, uh, most of the computing in the country was done at Bell Labs and IBM and Xerox. And each of them was a big company with an established position and a large basic research organization. And, uh, and uh, those organizations are not what they once were. And uh, you know, the number of companies in the computing pie is much bigger than it once was, and very few of them are making significant investments. So it's uh, a real issue. Let me ask you, join us for refreshments. Continue Thank to talk much. with Jeanette.